Hey guys, welcome to the shop. Man, I got some really exciting news to share with you this week in regards to the engine that we're gonna be putting in the old square body, square body truck. Now, I had quite a bit of time to think about this and there's a lot of options. We could have put a big block in here. We could have rebuilt the engine that came out of this thing originally. We could have went to the junkyard, bought a used LS engine, you know, stuck in there. But the prices on those even used right now is way up there. And I really like to stay away from stuff that I don't know the service history of, especially when it comes to performance engines. Or could have bought a crate motor, right? Those are available and they're somewhat reasonably priced. Turnkey, but that takes a lot of the fun out of it for me. So I decided to do none of those, actually. Let me show you what I did decide to do, and I think financial-wise and fun-wise, it was the best choice, and it's gonna make an awesome engine for this truck. So before I show you what we're gonna be working with here, I first wanna go over some of the reasons why I decided to go the way that I did. One, and probably the most demanding one, was finance. This had to be uh, very affordable, or at least pretty affordable or else it just wasn't going to happen or else or it would take so long to achieve you know that it was just unrealistic two yeah, i wanted something that was a proven platform something that was powerful reliable i also wanted it to fit right in there with no retrofitting you know i wanted parts for this engine to be affordable and available also wanted something that was easily modified down the road if I chose to to change something and all of those things including several more are the reason why I decided to go the way that I did so let me show you this thing and I'll explain some more of the issues or reasons you know along the way so what I decided to go with is a Chevy small block Chevy small block 350 but it's not just any normal small block 350. Let me explain to you what makes this one special over my old engine that came out of the truck originally. So this is a brand new casting. It's a 350 casting that has been bored 30 on each cylinder. So it's 4.030 bore over the original four inch bore that a 350 comes with. Also this block has been clearanced down around the crankshaft for a 400 small block crank which in turn gives this a quarter inch more travel on each piston than what it come with from the factory. So the larger bores with the longer stroke gives this more displacement and it makes it a 383 stroker. I know a lot of people have heard that. This has been around for a long time. People have been making these small blocks into stroker motors for a very long time and it really does not affect the reliability of these things. It, you just get more displacement, more power, same small package which is really nice now let me explain to you how i ended up with this because it's brand new so the way that i ended up with this setup is through a friend and colleague of mine who had started this engine project several years ago just due to life changes having kids building a home you know it just never really materialized for him so he had this sitting in his shop he knew that i was looking basically for this engine and he offered it up to me at a pretty good price so i've got basically new kit at a you know, used price plus another big bonus to this thing is that the machine work's already done on it and it's been professionally done in, a, in an automotive machine shop i know a lot of guys probably was thinking that i was going to machine the block that i had and to be honest although i probably could have pulled it off i don't have an automotive machine shop here and if you look at the equipment that they have versus the ones that i have they're totally different. I don't have any line honing equipment or anything like that. It would have been a real compromise. So I think that this was definitely the best way to go. Financial, time, and just probably outcome wise. So plus it's just a better block. And in my opinion anyway, let me show you why I believe that this is a better, just a better block than what I had originally. So I'm sure a few of you out there are wondering what makes this block better than the one that you had originally aren't they small block 350s both of them and the answer is yes they are except for this is a more modern block already set up and machined to accept the roller camshaft which is really nice because they're far less prone to wear than the old flat tappet setups and supposedly you get a little better performance out of them a little less friction right they don't require the same oils i know i would re i would run a zddp additive a zinc additive to my old flat tappet setup to try to keep that camshaft happy and not to wipe it out and these won't require that they just don't have the same oiling requirements on the cam train on the valve train anyway as far as lifters are concerned also this is a four bolt main block 
which means the three central main caps on the block here that hold the crankshaft in are held down by four bolts where originally you know my old motor that come out of the truck is a two bolt main not a huge difference not in the horsepower uh, area that i'm working with two bolt main holds up just fine but four bolt main is a little more desirable also and a big difference to me big plus is that this is a single piece rear main oil seal and they're far less likely to leak than my old setup which was the two piece and i've put two rear main oil seals in that truck it's seeped every time you know but you know sometimes they'll leak sometimes they don't but most of the time they do and these are just far less likely to leak so another big difference and other than that i think they're pretty much the same So because I've got this block tore down completely, there's no oil galley plugs in this thing, there's nothing. It's completely stripped and I'm giving it a good thorough cleaning. Even though it is brand new, it's not as clean as what you know I would like or probably what a lot of you guys would think for a brand new engine. So I'm making sure that it is extremely clean before I start assembling anything. And any job that I need to do that produces metal chips, I'm doing that now before my final thorough cleaning. So one modification that I'm doing right now is adapting these front three oil galley plugs. It's for the lifters and it's, these are drilled completely through the block and it's the same thing on the other side. What I'm doing is modifying these to accept a screw in pipe plug over what they did from the factory, which is just a press in aluminum plug, probably either held in with some retaining compound and just a press fit. Sometimes they'll be staked over, but these were just pressed in. So I used a threaded rod from the back and just knocked those plugs out, resized these two holes to accept a 3 8 MPT tap, and I'm tapping them out to the screw-in plugs, which I think long-term would just be more reliable, or at least it'll make me feel better. Because if those come out, you know, you're going to have a bad day. So let me show you all I got to do is tap this one hole out and I'll be done with this modification. So I'm just making sure I get this pipe tap really straight in the hole. So if one of these plugs come out one of the pressed in plugs or screw in plug for that matter, your oil pressure will drop to basically nothing, or it could, and uh, you know, just totally ruin your engine. So I'll trust this screw in plug over that pressed in plug, even though they were in there really good and probably would not have leaked. The major reason why I've removed and replacing these plugs is because it allows me to clean this thing so much better. I can clean all the way through the galley versus just coming up to a dead end here and having a you know little pocket for debris and stuff to sit in. So normally I don't use any tapping fluid on cast iron, but this tap just seems to work better with a little bit of lubrication on it. And uh, and it seems to hold the chips and stuff on the tap a little better than in them just falling around inside the hole. Not that it really matters, because this is going to be cleaned heavily, but you get the idea. So all I want is this plug right here to set flush with the front of the block when it's screwed in tight. And I don't need to go any deeper than that. Right, there's no benefit. Now on this one, you, you only go in very little because there is an oil galley in there. You have to really be careful. If you tap that too deep and run a plug in too far in the top one, you know, you'll damage the engine. So you got to be very careful. So there's all three galleys done. Now I feel a little bit better knowing that these have a screw-in plug. So there we go. That's about as flush as it needs to be. It ain't got to be exactly perfect, just close. I don't want it sticking out hitting the cam timing gear. And that should work. It makes me a little more confident about these plugs and much more confident about being able to get these all clean the way that at least I feel that they should be. 
So here's a modification that I got out of one of my books that I thought was worthwhile, and it's not really a permanent modification. You can always go back on it if you choose to just change camshafts or something, and that is to limit the amount of oil flow that goes down through the vent holes in the top of the lifter valley here and push that excess oil to go through the front of the block, down behind the timing cover, and then to the back of the block. That way it doesn't fall directly down on the rotating assembly and chew up a bunch of energy for no reason because this is a pressurized oil system in this thing. You know, none of the crankshaft needs drip oiling. It doesn't necessarily do anything. So what I've done, hopefully it shows here, is I've tapped out these 7 16 8 7 16 holes that are in the top of the block here, added a small uh, pipe stub in those holes, just red Loctite it in. That way, all of the oil that gets up here is forced to the back of the block through these drain holes or to the front of the block through those drain holes, and it doesn't drip down over the camshaft and over the uh, crankshaft, eating up a bunch of energy. Now, you wouldn't want to do this, I don't think it'd be a good idea with a flat tappet camshaft that requires a, just as much lubrication as it can get. This is going to be a roller setup, so it's not going to care, right? It'll get all the oil that it needs just that run down the lifters. So by adding these pipe stubs, we force that oil to the back and the front of the block, and we still maintain all of our crankcase venting that we had before. Plus, if we want to go back with a flat tappet cam and we're concerned that it's not going to get enough oil, with this setup, we just screw these out and nothing's changed. So a neat little modification just to force the oil to the front or the back of the block so it doesn't drip down on the rotating assembly. So just in case you don't have a ton of measuring tools, that's still really no excuse not to measure your rod, your main bearing clearances. It's extremely important. In fact, it can make the difference in between your build lasting or just detonating within minutes You know, if you mess up a critical clearance. And it doesn't take you know, a toolbox full of tools and expensive measuring equipment in order to do it. In fact, I think I paid eight bucks for the method that I'm going to show you. A lot of you have seen this before, but I'm sure some of you haven't. So let me show you the way that we're going to measure these bearing clearances on the super, super cheap. So we're going to be checking the clearance on this back main journal. Now, I've cleaned the seat really well. I put installed the bearing and I've wiped all the oil off of it. Did the same thing to the cap and cleaned the rod off, or the crank off. So there's no oil on any of this, and I've installed my front main bearing as well so my crank sets in line. So I'm just gonna set the crank in here, and then I'll show you the technique that we're gonna use to get our clearance in between our bearings and the crank. So what we're gonna be using is a product called Plastigage, and it just comes in this thin paper package, just a precision extruded piece of plastic that once it's deformed, keeps its shape. So what I've done is I have cut a very small piece right there, and I'm gonna set it on the crankshaft if it will not stick to my fingers. Probably the hardest part. And then we'll install our bearing cap and we'll torque it down. All right, everything's clean. I'm gonna set the bearing cap on there and try not to knock off our little piece of uh, plastic gauge. I'm gonna tap this down and we've got our pre-grease bolts here. That way we get a good torque value. So there's our flattened piece of plastic gauge, and in the package that it comes in, there is a scale that you use to determine how much clearance you have, and all you do is mate them up there until you find one that's the same size, and it looks like we have three thousandths of an inch oil clearance on this bearing journal, and you can just, if you're a metric guy, you just flip the paper over, and it looks like it's 0 0.076 millimeter. So there you go. 
super easy and about as cheap as you're gonna get for a measuring tool. With this kit that was less than $9 to my house, I believe, you know, you could do probably three engines with this stuff if you were careful and just didn't waste it. Two kit, two different types of plastic gauge in this kit. The green that we used is from one to three thousandths. That's the range that it works best in. And then the red is from two thousandths to six thousandths. And then you can get a blue plastic gauge, which is four to nine thousandths. So I'm gonna stick this in the toolbox. Nothing wrong with it. Great, cheap measuring tool. So now I'm gonna check crankshaft end play. How much can this crankshaft move back and forth in this block before this thrust bearing, which is the only one that has any thrust bearing capabilities in this whole setup, before it stops the crankshaft from moving. Now we've got an indicator just magnetized on the front of the block and we're touched off on the nose of the crankshaft. And I'm gonna use this screwdriver to pry just lightly, this crank back and forth to see how much free movement I have before this thrust bearing stops it, right? Just wanna know, because I wanna record it. So here I've got a brand new Greenfield tap and die, 7 16 14 bottoming tap. And what I'm going to do is check all of the head bolts on this block to make sure that they are you know, in good shape. I believe when these are tapped, they're, they're mechanically tapped by a big head that has multiple taps, right? So it's very possible to have good, one good hole and beside it a not so good one and so on. So I'm just going to run through and make sure they're all uniform, or at least uniform to this tap, which is a quality tap, not one of the cheap ones. So make me happy to know that they're all you know, properly formed that way when the heads are tightened down on this you know it all pulls down nice and even so I learned that these need to be really clean the hard way uh, it's probably more important actually on a used block than it is on a new one but I was working on a it's a 3.6 liter v6 Ford motor and I put head gaskets on this thing twice and both times it blew it blew the head gaskets and I could not figure out why this thing wouldn't seal. I know that the decks were flat. I know that the heads were flat because I just had them done. But for some reason, it just kept blowing head gaskets. I was torquing this thing in the proper procedure to the proper amount. Problem was that there were several blind holes in the block that over the years had gotten full of goo. And even though the torque wrench was telling me that I was torqued to the proper value, I wasn't pressing down on the head like I should. I was just compressing the goo at the bottom of the threaded hole so that made me from that point on check the head bolt holes in the block to make sure that they are indeed clean and you know, properly properly sized and some of these are a little tight so i'm glad i'm going over them So even though I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night, I do not consider myself to be an expert when it comes to engine building, so do your own research. And this is just the information that I'm going with. Now, I have the piston rings here for my number one cylinder, and I'm keeping all of those you know, together, right? Throughout the whole motor. And I'm documenting what my piston ring end gap is, and I'm writing that in a book. So not only for my piston rings, but for every clearance on this entire engine, I am checking and documenting it. So I'm going to show you how I go through just really quick on this one bore gapping my piston rings on the end. So this is my top ring for my number one cylinder and I'm going to stick it in the bore here carefully. I'm going to use this tool here that was sent to me by Brett Myers out of Canada. He sent me quite a few you know small block specific uh, building tools and I really appreciate it so big thanks to him. And all this does is press that ring down inside the bore a specific amount and make sure that it is square with the bore. So I believe the general rule of thumb is four thousandths of an inch piston ring end gap per inch of bore. So this is a four inch bore, so it should at a minimum have sixteen thousandths of an inch at, uh, at our gap here. And it does. There's our sixteen thousandths of an inch feeler gauge. 
So it's probably more like 17,000. So like I said, I have this written down in the book, but I'd much rather it be on the large side than on the small side. Because if you produce too much heat in the cylinder, let's say you add nitrous or something, and that ring gap closes up and has nowhere to go, well, you can cause catastrophic failure in your engine because of that. So it's a really important procedure to check all of your cylinders, all your rings, make sure that they're whatever the manufacturer suggests the ring gap should be depending on your application. And it's going to be different from, between your top ring, second ring, and your uh, oil ring. So all information you'll want to look into and verify. I wouldn't just buy a set of rings and stick them in there, although a lot of people do and they get away with it. It's a good idea to check them. And if the ring gap is too tight, then you would file that ring end gap, like a jeweler's file or, or a points file, making sure to keep the ends parallel with each other, you know, to the at least meet the minimum requirements. So there you go. That is the procedure that I'm going through on this entire engine, making sure that the ring gaps are what they should be. So another thing that I'm doing is going through all of these cylinders, making sure that they're round within reason, that they're not tapered, and that they are actually on size. And there's a few ways, obviously, to do that. You can use a, a telescoping bore gauge, and that works, but it's pretty slow and hard to map the size of the cylinder and the taper with one of those, but it can be done. Probably the quickest way is a bore gauge like this. This is a really nice shear Tomiko to within, you know, within a tenth. And it is very accurate and shows any indifference like the top of the bore or at the bottom. Now I'm just checking these just out of curiosity and they all look pretty good. They're all within you know, a few tenths at least um, from top to bottom and, and out around. But that will change. Now on some of the high class engines, what they'll do, because when you bolt a head on this, I mean, it for, it puts all sorts of forces on the block here and moves it. Nothing is 100% rigid. And those bores that were round before the cylinder head was clamped on there are no longer round after it. So a lot of the high class engines, from what I've read anyway, I've never, never took a part in any of it or had one done, but they'll bolt what is a mock cylinder head onto the engine. They'll torque it down to the specs that the cylinder head's gonna be torqued to, but that big plate of steel has holes in it to where they can do their machine work. And that way, when they take that off and they put the actual cylinder head back on, that those bores stay as round and as true as possible. I thought that was really neat, and you know, I'm just scratching the surface here. I'm not some expert in the field, but I am checking these bores to make sure that they are, you know, very close to the size that they should be. They're not, one's not got a ton of taper in it or, you know, egg shaped, right? So, thought that was interesting. You know, there's a lot to it, obviously. But there we go. Just another way to check and make sure that things are close to what they should be. So this bore gauge also allows me to check my big ends and my rods for you know, out around and for size as well, which is really nice. You know, just bearing out, clamp down to the proper torque value, right? Check for size. I'm doing that on all of the all of the rods as well, just because it makes me feel good and I think it's the right thing to do. You know, on this table, I have the vast majority of components that are going to go inside of the motor. We have a scat a cast steel crank perfectly fine with that. Scat forged steel connecting rods with ARP hardware, forged aluminum pistons. We have a Howard's roller camshaft, which unfortunately I didn't select. The guy that uh, bought this engine package selected it and it's a little bit large. We'll see. We'll probably run it and uh, see how it performs. We have a set of roller uh, hydraulic lifters. We also have a set of no-name stainless roller tipped rockers that we'll be using as well. <clears throat> so the idea with all these tools is that I can just check and verify and write down all of my all of my bearing clearances. I can make sure that they're within the range that they should be. It just makes me feel good to be able to do that. That way I have the best chance of having a long running, you know, well good performing uh, engine when I'm done. And I'm also of the mindset trust but verify right these are mass produced components and people are people and they get things wrong so it's a good idea 
to check for yourself, right? That way, if something fails, you have no one to blame but yourself. And that's the way that I feel anyway. Here's a good example right here on this oil pump of a trust but verify, you know, when it comes to a mass-produced component. This is a brand new Made in America Mellings high volume oil pump that I pulled out of the package probably about an hour ago. You know, got to looking over it, pulled the top off, checked the clearance on the gears. Just for my information, I wanted to see what kind of condition it is, check the mating surfaces. And I got to looking over the housing here and I noticed that it's got a big old chunk of casting sand, because this is a sand cast unit, stuck to the body here and on the other side. So you would not want that breaking off, falling down inside of your engine, you know. It's uh, quite a bit, right? Hopefully you can see that. I know the window is letting in some harsh light, but good reason why you should check over things for yourself. So here's our rear main bearing cap. This is our oil pump, and it hooks directly on top of that. This will have a pickup screen that will pull oil from the oil pan through the pump. Right? This is what generates your oil pressure in the engine. It gets delivered into this first main cap, delivered into the main journals of the crank and then you know through a bunch of journals gets delivered to the actual camshaft. Well there's an issue, I don't know if it's an issue or not, but there's gains to be had by modifying the inside of the shape of the bowl here where the oil comes directly out of the pump. You can minimize the friction there, reduce parasitic loads and just improve the oiling of the entire system just by modifying the inside of this main bearing cap here and that's all I'm going to do just dress the inside of this to where oil actually wants to flow down that hole instead of it getting churned up and you know, causing a bunch of friction in there You may just touch it up just a bit, but pretty much, you know, that's it. So now oil should want to flow down that hole instead of just getting churned up on all them sharp edges. So I've got one of my pistons in this block here, and I'm just going to do a quick demo here. I've already done all of this, but I want to show you how I determined the size or the volume of these valve reliefs here. Now most piston manufacturers will just tell you, but it's not a bad idea to check and verify. So that's all I'm doing, and all this information uh, is used to generate the uh, engine's compression ratio. So let me show you how I checked all these to make sure that they actually are the size that they should be. So I've got a piece of acrylic here, and I drilled four small holes in it, and I'm going to stick this to the top of the piston using a little bit of silicone or just dielectric grease. So I've got just a glass syringe here measured in cc's and then some rubbing alcohol that I put some blue food coloring in so I can see it really well and I'm going to draw up just a specific amount. So we've got 10 cc's pulled up there and all I'm going to do is try not to make a mess. And then I just fill that void, try to fill the cavity in there. So there's a little better look. You can see that the volume there is full and because I knew how much fluid that I started with, you know, I just subtracted it from the uh, whatever's left, and that tells me the volume inside of those cavities. So, you know, there's a 
more refined way to do this, but you get the idea, right? So I'm having a ton of fun with this engine build. This is the first stroker that I've ever had any experience with personally. So I'm having a lot of fun learning all the ins and outs that are involved with it, all the special needs that this thing has, you know, that your normal small block 350 doesn't. Now, the rotating assembly on this thing, I'm really happy with all the components that I got with this. In fact, probably exactly what I would have bought had I just sourced the parts individually. Uh, so that's a really good thing. That scat cast crank will hold up plenty for the stuff that I'm going to do. This is not going to be a race engine, although I do want it to be a strong running and reliable setup. And all of the rotating assembly is balanced. It was professionally done and I think it's within a gram or so. I'll have to look at the paperwork to, to make sure, but it's really close and I'm more than happy with all the parts that we're going to be putting in this thing. What I have of parts anyway. And it's not a complete assembly that I can just bolt together and put in the truck, unfortunately. There's still quite a few things that I have to get. Got to get a flywheel for this thing because it came with a flex plate. And my original flywheel on my other engine won't work because this is a stroker motor. And it's going to take a 400 externally balanced 168 tooth flywheel. So in order to bolt this thing up, I have to get that. Also need to get a double roller adjustable timing set so I can degree my cam in well along with a water pump, timing cover, oil pan, oil pickup tube. You know, none of that stuff's either good on my other engine or will switch over seeing as they're you know, different castings. So there's quite a few things that I gotta get. I wanna get that RPM dual plane, the uh, Eldebrock uh, intake. I wanna get one of those with air gap and a few other things, right? Gaskets, a lot to be honest, but you know, we're closer than we were two weeks ago, so that's good. So I think that's it. You know, if you've got any questions, concerns, whatever, put them in the comments. I'd appreciate it. And uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll get to hear this thing run. I'm excited about it. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's helped me out whatsoever, much appreciated. And I'll see you next time.